You're listening to ReachMD, and this is Lipid Lumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, your host, and joining me today is Dr. Deborah Friedrich, who's an assistant professor at the University of South Florida's College of Nursing and director of Family Nurse Practitioner Concentration. She is a family nurse practitioner with a doctorate in nurse practitioner degree and a clinical lipid specialist in practice in Bradenton, Florida. Today we will be discussing the most common endocrine disorder in women, polycystic ovarian syndrome, also known as PCOS. We'll touch on the epidemiology, the prevalence, the diagnosis, and the long-term risks and treatment options. Dr. Frederick, thank you so much for joining us to talk about this important topic. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for having me. My pleasure. So let's start off talking about the prevalence and the epidemiology of uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. How common is it, and uh, what should our listeners know about making the diagnosis? Well, it is a lot more common than we realize, affecting, depending on the criteria you use for diagnosis, anywhere between 5 and 20% of reproductive age women. So it is very, very common. So tell me about what types of patients one might be most suspicious of in terms of uh, the incidence and prevalence of the disorder. And then if you can talk, us, talk to us a little bit about how to make the diagnosis and, and who should we screen for PCOS? Well, you know, there are some ethnic variations that put patients at greater risk for this. Native Americans um, seem to have about a 20% prevalence of PCOS, and Latino and Greeks have about a 9% prevalence, and Caucasians and African Americans a little lower prevalence at 4%. Um, Usually what you're going to see, and, and, you know, this is something that we see as primary care providers every day in our practice, but I think... When we think along the terms of PCOS, we always think it's a gynecological problem when, in fact, you know, it's a syndrome that's a collection of a lot of physical findings and and complaints by patients that can be different for every patient. And it is a systemic metabolic disorder. That's why we really need to focus in on this in primary care. And normally, you know, what you might find presenting to your office would be patients that have maybe menstrual irregularities, um, maybe some infertility issues. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them do have some obesity problems, um, hirsutism or, you know, abnormal hair growth. Uh, A lot of the adolescent and uh, young adults will complain of acne, uh, alopecia, and because of the insulin resistance that's really a prominent um, clinical feature of this. They have the ankyntosis nigricans. Uh, and interesting a lot, enough, these patients also have a lot of sleep apnea, um, which really, you know, in studies, it's, you know, it, it's not related to the BMI and neck size of these patients. It seems to be a, an independent risk factor. So more of a central sleep apnea, you think? Rather I think than more central than obstructive. Obviously, as lipidologists, we see a lot of patients with insulin-resistant type lipid profiles with high triglycerides, low HDL, and impaired fasting glucose. When someone like that comes to your office, do you screen all of them for uh, all the females for PCOS, or how do you decide who to screen? Well, you know, if I see patients that present with these characteristics, I you know, I do do a lipid profile on them, and I do check for insulin resistance, and the majority of them will have the characteristic uh, low HDL, high triglycerides, and the actual more atherogenic type um, LDL particle, you know, the small, dense LDL particle. Um, and obviously, they have the insulin resistance, which kind of you know, it, it, it leads into the hyperinsulinemia, and eventually these patients are at much greater risk for diabetes. So, you know, it's so important to get them in the early stages, so hopefully we can prevent that aspect of it. So uh, what further workup would you do if you see somebody that you suspect PCOS on? Would you get an ultrasound of their... Well, you know, obviously the, the um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, you know, it, it is not actually a mandatory criteria for it to have the polycystic ovaries, but because of the hormonal imbalances and their lack of ovulation, you know, they don't have the follicle that ruptures, so these, um, these eggs are, you know, these follicles actually just kind of 
form a cyst in the ovaries, and some of these patients will have 10, 12, up to 50 ovarian cysts that cause, and sometimes that is a presenting symptom, the abdominal pain related to the cyst. But, you know, that is not in and of itself a mandatory criteria. Um, according, you know, the, the consensus, the overall consensus for diagnosing is um, any two of either the infrequent or absent ovulation, um, the hyperandrogenism, um, the, that hirchitism, the acne and alopecia that go along with the physical components of the androgen um, increase, and then the actual elevated levels of free uh, or total testosterone. You can have either or one of those and the polycystic ovaries. So, you know, the fact that you only have to have two of the following, the cystic ovaries is not a mandatory diagnostic criteria. And then, of course, you do have to rule out other problems, you know, that, that could be disorders of, um, you know, pituitary tumors and um, high levels of cortisol, Cushing syndrome, um, any kind of anterior, anterior pituitary problem, you do have to rule those out before you make the diagnosis of PCOS. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to ReachMD. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, and I'm speaking with Dr. Deborah Frederick regarding polycystic ovarian syndrome. So tell us a little more, Dr. Frederick, about the long-term health risks associated with PCOS. Obviously, with atherogenic dyslipidemia, we're worried about cardiac disease. Are there any other concerns uh, long-term when people have this disorder? There are. You know, the, the women with PCOS are about three to six times more likely to have type 2 diabetes than, you know, than women uh, in the general population. They have, um, as you mentioned, more um, cardiovascular disease risk related to the dyslipidemia and the insulin resistance, but also they have higher levels of um, the high sensitivity C-reactive proteins. They um, have higher um, carotid intima medial thickness on ultrasound. Uh, they also have more um, endometrial cancer related to this unopposed estrogen uh, related to the hormonal effects of this. Um, and they, in general, are um, more prone to having mood disorders uh, compared to women of similar BMI without PCOS. So anxiety and depression seems to be uh, prevalent in this population as well. What about family members? I mean, is there an increased uh, incidence within families, and what would be the genetic predisposition towards this disorder? There is. Actually, it's interesting that sisters of PCOS patients have about a 50% chance of also having PCOS. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting in the literature. Um, and also, any patients that have a family history of diabetes, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, and uh, any history of irregular menses or anovulation, uh, there seems to be a, a correlation with, with family history and PCOS. I've got two questions for you then. So once you see a patient that is referred to you for dyslipidemia and, and appears to be insulin resistant, do you mainly focus on the physical exam, looking for the acne and hirsutism and things like that? Or what would be your workup to try and make the diagnosis, a testosterone level? How, how do you work that patient up? Well, you know, I, I start with the, whatever bothers the patient the most, you know, as long as it's not a life-threatening issue. You know, if I have an adolescent where the hirsutism or the acne is really debilitating for them, which it can be, um, I focus on that. You know, if it's fertility and the anovulation and the, you know, um, amenorrhea, then we focus on that. Um, the, the primary focus of treatment in these patients is weight reduction. You know, a weight reduction, just a, about a 5% total weight loss can lower insulin levels. It can increase fertility, reduce the hirsutism and acne, and actually lower the free testosterone levels. So we really try to focus on that. And sometimes when the patients understand that even a 5% total weight loss can improve all those parameters, they're a little more, you know, interested in trying that first. You know, there's, there's a lot of other um, factors that we can use for dyslipidemia. Of course, statins um, are, you know, can be used. They really are the only medications that have been studied in PCOS patients. 
Um, but in that population of women who oftentimes are trying to get pregnant, it's really contraindicated. And so lifestyle changes really are our best um, option. The, um, the insulin sensitizers are used um, with, with a lot of um, benefit. The insulin sensitizers seem to help all aspects as well, um, you know, the metformin, the, the TZDs. We, um, we know that those medications reduce the glucose levels, but they also improve the lipid parameters and the pro-inflammatory profiles. They um, help restore or can help restore some of the ovulation in these patients, and, um, and also by doing that, they can increase the pregnancy rates. And uh, these also reduce the androgen production, so they can lessen the hertz- hertzism and the acne related to the PCOS. So once you've made the diagnosis, you focus on lifestyle, insulin sensitizers, maybe anti-androgen and lipid-lowering therapy, and I guess there's a role for oral contraceptives in there too, correct? Most definitely there's a role for oral contraceptives. Um, They can help regulate the menstrual cycle. Um, They can also reduce the signs of the the hyperandrogenism, which is, you know, the, the actual physical problems of hirsutism and acne, which, um, as I mentioned before, even with some of the insulin resistance and the cardiovascular disease risk um, in these patients, they don't feel that. They don't see that. So the abnormal hair and acne is really their debilitating factor. Um, The oral contraceptives can um, help with the endometrial hyperplasia, too, by, you know, providing a better exposure to progesterone, um, and obviously they're used for contraceptives. And in the case where you have to use um, andro- androgenic medications, um, obviously you want to use contraceptim- contraceptives uh, in combination with those because they are teratogenic. So lastly, I, I'm going to tie you down to one issue, clinical issue. A patient comes in who has metabolic syndrome. And you're trying to decide, is this just a patient who carries an insulin resistance gene with metabolic syndrome or a patient with PCOS? Other than the physical exam, looking for hirsutism or uh, signs of uh, acne, those types of things, in other words, excess androgenic physical findings, what other workup would you do to try and make the diagnosis of PCOS versus just the traditional metabolic syndrome that we see so much of in this uh, high-calorie diet obesity society? Well, um, you know, the, the uh, infrequent or absent ovulation and amenorrhea, the, you know, the problems with the menstrual cycle, symptoms related to infertility, you know, if they have been trying to get pregnant or not using birth control for a significant amount of time, that kind of puts a red flag up for me. And then if you're doing an ultrasound and you actually see uh, polycystic ovaries, that's also you know, a pretty significant sign, especially when used in conjunction with the other, um, you know, other criteria. It's very helpful. And then when you do prescribe lifestyle to them, are there any specific uh, programs that you recommend? Or what do, what do you suggest in terms of weight loss? Do you give them a dietary counseling directly or do you refer them? Sometimes I will refer them if I think they're the type of patient that will do, do well with that type of structure. But um, usually I'll give them a diet that reduces their calories about 500 to 750 kilocalories per day um, with, of course, less than 30% fat. Um, increasing their fiber is very important. Um, they seem to do better, actually, on lower glycemic index diets because of the insulin resistance. Um, we don't really recommend using the um, weight loss medications in these patients. One thing, it hasn't been studied in PCOS patients, and two, um, because of their childbearing age, we would really like to stay away from that. But we also try to give them a prescription for exercise, um, at least 10,000 steps a day, or to lose weight, uh, 15,000 steps a day. And, And kind of emphasizing with them, too, that even without the weight loss, if they can, if they'll get up and move, that moderate intensity exercise, they can improve their insulin resistance and dyslipidemia without the weight loss. So sometimes that's a motivation to just, you know, get up off the couch. Sure, and great advice for anybody with insulin resistance.
Um, so finally, you had mentioned that the sisters had a fairly high incidence, so there obviously is some genetic predisposition. Do you recommend family screening when you've made the diagnosis in a patient? I do. I do. Just like in my lipid clinic when I have a, a familial, you know, hypercholesterol patient um, that I think there's a family correlation with certain types of, uh, you know, syndromes or dyslipidemia, I always have them um, talk to their family members about symptoms, related symptoms, and, and to have them be screened by their primary care provider as well. Well, that's extremely helpful, and I'd like to thank you very much for being with us today. Unfortunately, we're out of time, or I would ask you many more questions about this important topic. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown. I, I truly enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, and you've been listening to Lipid Luminations, sponsored by the National Lipid Association on ReachMD. Be sure to visit our website at ReachMD.com, featuring podcasts of this and other series, and thank you very much for listening.